Hey YouTube, today we're going to be going over the one of the most powerful tools we have in our tool set for training and fine tuning large language models, LORAs. We're going to be covering how do LORAs work, what are they, and how do we actually implement and use LORAs to fine tune our large language models using Ugubuga's text generation web UI. If you'd like to skip the conversation about how do they work, you can skip to this timestamp. But if you'd like to learn how they work under the hood, stay tuned. So let's get started. So why LoRa is a big deal is because it's essentially doing a dimensionality reduction. And why this is the case is that during fine tuning tasks, we find that these uh, generative models are really just tuning some lower dimensional set of their parameters. So why retrain the entire network or a layer when we can just create our own lower dimensional representation? So this is taking advantage of a concept in linear algebra called rank decomposition, where the most common type we're taught is singular value decomposition. And to understand why this works, we just need to understand one concept in linear algebra, and that's when can we multiply matrices. So the dimensions, you know, if you say an M by N matrix, what we're talking about is how many rows and columns are there in the matrix. So if we have a two by two, we would have four values in the matrix. So you get the number of values by just multiplying these uh, dimensions. So M by N equals Z, which is the dimensions or the number of elements in that uh, matrix. So if we want to multiply two matrices, the only thing we need is that their inner dimensions match. So if we have two matrices, for example, a four by one and a one by four, we can multiply them because their inner dimensions match and we end up with a four by four. So if we take this and extend it to rank decomposition, what it says is if we have a matrix A, which is M by N, we can represent it by three different matrices that have dimension M by R for B, R and R for C, and R and M for D. And if we multiply them together, we just get an M by N matrix back. And this is powerful because memory matters. So if we start with a matrix that has the elements one, two, three, four, two, four, six, eight, we can represent this exactly with, the, with these two vectors, which are four by one and one by four. And if we multiply them together, we get this four by four back. And instead of having to store 16 values, we're storing eight values. But we don't need to represent things exactly. Approximation is also okay. So if we start with a matrix A that's 500 by 100, that has 50,000 values in it. But instead of having to store all of that, we could just approximate the matrix A by having a matrix B that has dimensions five by 10 and a matrix D that has dimensions 10 by 100. The inner dimensions match, and if we ever multiply these together, we get a 500 by 100 matrix back, but instead we're just having to store 6,000 values. And these memory savings get bigger and bigger the more numbers, you know, the bigger the dimensions of the matrices, matrices are. So how these LoRa matrices play into the generative network is we attach the LoRa matrices to the feed forward portion of our transformer model. Now they could attach other places, but we typically attach them to the feed forward portion. And we're going to hold the weights in the feed forward layer as being fixed. And instead we're going to train and update the weights inside of the matrices for these LoRa's. And all the LoRa has to do is have its outer dimensions match the dimensions of the feed forward network, which in this case are N, but the inner dimensions can be M, which can be much, much less than N. And remember, if we multiply N by N, then we get the total number of elements, and that can be much, much less, so we're not dealing with the same memory constraints. So when these two multiplications are done by the feed forward and by the LoRa's, we just add their results together and we influence the output weights. And this dimensionality reduction is done all over the place through principal, principal component analysis or autoencoders, and we're just now applying it to our large language models or our generative models. So now let's move forward and see how we can actually use LoRa's to help fine tune your language model. Today we're gonna to be using the Ugabuga Text Generation Web UI, and we're just gonna go under the training tab. 
So once we go into this tab, we're gonna be uh, presented with a lot of different options. But before we set any of these, and we will go over them, we wanna make sure we have our training data. And that can be presented in two forms, as a raw text file or as a formatted data set. And the raw text file is just that. It's a splattering of text that we can use to give the network new information or teach it something new. But the formatted, we can teach the network something new about its behavior in this kind of instruction output format. And in this case, I have the user asking, hello, I would like to speak to you about your car's extended warranty. And the assistant replying, what about my car's extended warranty? So these will be in the description below because I just wanna help everybody know kind of how to format these things. So now we can go ahead and start talking about what these hyperparameters do and how they affect your training. So the first thing we wanna do is give it a name. In my case, I'm calling it Amon's example. And you can copy them from another set of LoRa's or your own previous LoRa's as well but batch size. Now batch size plays into the epoch. And remember for each epoch, the network will see the totality of your training set, but the batch size says how much of it do you want to see at once? And higher values can lead to overfitting or memorization issues, but lower values can lead to longer training periods. But we can also do the micro batch, which if you're if you're having VRAM issues, a micro batch can help save memory by chunking it out a little further. Epoch. So the epoch describes how many times is the network going to see the totality of the data set during the training process. Learning rate, how quickly are the weights going to be updated? And the default value tends to work pretty well. The learning rate scheduler updates the learning rate during the training process. And I tend to use linear or cosine, but you may experiment with that for your data set to see what performs best. The LoRa rank describes the dimensionality of the LoRa matrices. So higher values can lead to significantly more fine results, but use a lot more memory, whereas smaller values will use a lot less memory, but you can also get good results out of it. It really depends on the complexity of your data set and how much uh, change in the behavior you're looking for. The LoRa Alpha describes how much influence does the LoRa have on the feed forward portion of the network. Higher values result in much greater impacts, lower values result in lower impacts. So if you think your LoRa is having too much of an impact, you can always try backing it off. And then cutoff length has another big impact on memory. It's how much text is presented at once. And so if you are having issues with training memory, backing that off can help quite a bit. So the other thing about the training data is also once we go to load it, we want to make sure they're in the correct extension. Our training format or our formatted needs to be a JSON. And then our uh, text just needs to be a .txt, our raw text. So once we have that loaded, we can go ahead and select it. We want to have a training and a validation set. And oh, I don't know why that one. There we go. And we can go ahead and select our validated form. And then we just need to tell it what the format we're going to be using is. In my case, I'm going to be using an alpaca format. And then how many times do I want to, how many steps do I want to take before evaluating my network's performance? And there are some advanced options as well before we start. And that's namely the lower dropout. The rest of these options I don't think need to be touched very much, but the dropout can be important because it helps to prevent overfitting. So you might have to toy with this value if you notice that your network is overfitting or memorizing. But once we have that, we just click on Start LoRa Training, and that's all we have to do. So. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe, and please let us know in the comments what you'd like to learn about next. And join us next time when we're going to be continuing our conversation about how do large language models work under the hood, specifically positional encoding and embedding spaces.